Hi, this is Sarah Wolfson. I'm a geriatric nurse practitioner. Uh, welcome to APP to APP lectures. Uh, this evening, we have two audiences. We have our APP to APP, but we also have My Catholic Doctor. And uh, my topic is obstructive sleep apnea, mostly known as OSA. Um, my take on it has to do more with my geriatric population, but I did um, bring in some things about younger folks and even kids. So um, let's go ahead. And objectives, um, it's important to know the signs and symptoms and when it's appropriate to screen for sleep apnea. Uh, we want to go over the tools that you use for an initial screening. Understand the complications of untreated sleep apnea. And um, we also have some tips for patients to better acclimate to the CPAP or BiPAP. For most people, if they just get right into it with the mask on at night, they can feel very claustrophobic. And that's probably the main reason why people are not compliant with wearing the CPAP. So for prevalence, um, there's a study going back to 2015 50% of men and 23% of women had at least a moderate uh, sleep apnea. In the U.S., you know, there are estimates of, of really the majority of men and a greater majority of women who have OSA that is undiagnosed. Um, as we age, our risk for developing sleep apnea does go up, and it probably is reflective of the changes, the natural changes in our sleep particularly our deep sleep as we age. Men do have higher risk of developing than women until women, we hit menopause. And then that kind of puts us equal with men in terms of risk. Usually you'll see in men snoring and you'll see a witnessing of the apneic episodes where they just stop breathing while women tend more towards insomnia and daytime sleepiness. And for women, they actually have the higher mortality rate than men do with the sleep apnea. Obesity, of course, is a major factor. Even a 10% increase in weight uh, gives a six-fold increase in moderate to severe OSA. Uh, persons with history of cardiovascular disease also have a, an additional uh, risk of OSA. So we're talking about hypertension, coronary artery disease, heart failure, stroke, and um, pre-existing arrhythmias. So symptoms, um, feeling tired or exhausted when you're waking up, um, knowing that you slept all night, but you're not feeling rested, um, daytime sleepiness, snoring, mood changes with depression and anxiety, particularly Brain function not seems like it's falling off a little bit. People complain about memory loss, foggy brain, concentration trouble, um, frequent awakenings during the night, pauses in breathing while you're sleeping that others, your bedmate or whoever, uh, witnesses. Um, unusual breathing patterns, breathing patterns that look a little bit different from the norm. Um, insomnia night sweats, feeling restless at night, uh, sometimes sexual dysfunction, waking up, feeling short of breath or feeling like um, you're actually choking and then headaches. So it doesn't take having all of these symptoms, but having many symptoms, especially the awakening and feeling tired when you've had a full night's sleep, the mood changes, the cognitive changes. Um, and of course the pauses in breathing that are witnessed. And when we do our dementia screen, um, one of the things we look at is whether or not we think a person has a high risk for sleep apnea as possibly causing whatever their cognitive complaints might be. So this is the stop bang questionnaire, um, which is a pretty common questionnaire. You'll see a lot of anesthesiologists use it before um, surgery. Um, and it's basically questions, you know, depending upon your symptoms. And then there's a score below that tells you the interpretation. There's snoring, tiredness, of course, stop bang. You can see each symptom starts with um, the beginning letter. And so generally zero to two is a low risk, three to four is an intermediate risk. And of course, some people can have a higher risk than that. 
this is something that you definitely need to do for screening. There's also the Epworth sleepiness scale, which sometimes is done. The um, stop bang, of course, is really the big thing to do. The Epworth sleepiness scale really just kind of helps measure how people are actually doing sleep wise. Um, this can just give you additional information along with what you have, especially if the stop bang is sort of borderline, maybe a little bit extra information would be helpful. Um, it's very important to get a sleep history. So when do people go to bed? Do they fall asleep right away? Do they have trouble falling asleep? Do they fall asleep okay, but they wake up at two or three in the morning every night? Are they napping during the day? Um, are they napping an hour or two hours during the, way, during the day, which takes away from their nighttime? Do they have nasal congestion or mouth breathing? And how much caffeine are they consuming? Because we know that a lot of caffeine, especially if it's consumed after 12 noon, can cause you to have poor sleep. Physical exams, the mouth, the tongue, the palate, tonsils, uvula, jaw, all of that goes into checking whether or not a person may have a risk for, um, for sleep apnea, and especially you know with anatomical issues. So there's definitions. Um, there is obstructive sleep apnea. That is what happens during that is your throat muscles, they relax, they block the airway. It closes the airway, but you can still see respiration in the chest and the abdomen. This is what causes the frequent arousals and it you know, just kind of breaks up your sleep into increments. Central sleep apnea, and this list is, is, is the worsening as we go down. Central sleep apnea is a, is a difficulty interruption in the brain sending signals needed to breathe. This is neurological, this is not mechanical. So there's no airflow and there is no respiratory effort. The complex sleep apnea or mixed apnea actually is a combination of the obstructive and the central sleep apnea. It can also occur when you are being treated with CPAP for sleep apnea. There's no airflow. There may or may not be respiratory effort going on. Now, sleep studies, um, you know, if you think somebody, you know, their stop bang indicates that they could possibly have sleep apnea, you want to do your sleep studies. Polysomnography is the number one, the gold standard. It records the brain waves, gives you oxygen level and heart rate during the different phases of sleep. And it will give you eye and leg movements, which can also be important because some people have restless legs at night. There is a home test that can be done, home sleep testing, which is convenient for people who don't want to go into a lab. They can't go to a sleep lab. Um, it's best used as a confirmation of how well a device is working. Sometimes it doesn't really show the true severity of the disorder. Um, older people tend to not want to go to a sleep lab. Younger people tend to be a little bit more cooperative with the sleep lab. You can also do um, home oximetry, and that involves just getting um, an oximeter with a little uh, finger connection that goes on the finger, and then it's worn during the night, and it can be a first step for a lot of patients, and it will show you if people are desatting during the night. So a lot of times that can be a first step to try to figure out, you know, kind of ease people into the testing for the sleep apnea. This is um, polysomnography. This is on the left is what the person looks like. On the right is what the reading is that looks like a bunch of jumbled gobbledygook, but there are ways to interpret it. And generally you don't have to look at a report like this and interpret it. You will get a report from a sleep specialist or the lab person telling you exactly what the issue is. So you don't have to look at this and try to figure out. It is easier to figure out when you look at heart rate and oxygen. Um, and um, usually there can be anywhere from 20 to 30 little um, electrodes on the face and head. Um, so polysomnography basically is night all night long. It's, it, it's um, eight hours. Um, it can show you, do they need supplemental oxygen? Uh, it can give you a guide to, if they need a CPAP, 
what you want your settings to be. It can also guide body position. Are they better on their back? Or are they better on their side? It can record any seizures that might be happening. And it can also show you the REM sleep or versus the non-REM sleep. And it'll show you whatever's going on in the different, you know, stage one sleep and REM sleep. A hypnogram is the type of polysomnography that tracks sleep stages over time and the REM sleep. And typically patients run through these stages four to five times during a sleep period of about seven to nine hours. Home sleep apnea tests, again, do not record sleep necessarily. It does record airflow, chest and abdominal effort and oxygen saturation throughout the, the time of the sleep. Um, hopefully the person stays asleep. A lot of times with polysomnography, when you're wearing all that stuff and you're in a sleep lab, some people don't sleep very well. And so that can cause you a little bit of a problem. Um, so the best use, again, as I said before, of the HSAT is in looking for nighttime oxygen DSATs, reduced airflow. You can confirm the OSA, or you can also use it to make sure that the CPAP is actually working. And it really should not be used with people who have neuromuscular conditions or people who have had a history of CVA, severe insomnia, chronic opioid use, or severe cardiopulmonary disease, because it will not be as accurate. So the diagnostic criteria for obstructive sleep apnea, you have your polysomnogram or your home sleep apnea test that will show you greater than or equal to predominantly obstructive respiratory events per each hour of sleep, or greater than or equal to five predominantly obstructive respiratory events per hour, and one of the following being the daytime sleepiness, sleep that's not restful, fatigue or insomnia in the daytime, waking with breath holding, gasping or choking, observed snoring, observed breathing interruption or both, hypertension, mood disorder, cognitive dysfunction, heart disease, stroke, CHF, atrial fibro diabetes. And if you have people with those conditions and they are reporting sleep problems, then definitely it's a good idea to go ahead and screen for sleep apnea. So the criteria uh, from the previous slide are based on the number and type of what we call events that happen during the testing. So these events are described as um, apnea, which is a which is the absolute total lack of airflow. And again, that can be the obstructive, the central, or the mixed. There's also hypopneas, which is reduced airflow, not lack of airflow, but reduced airflow. And it's a result in uh, lowering of nasal pressure, drops in oxygen saturation. The arousals are the respiratory events that don't qualify as either of the above, but they really disrupt the sleep and they could lead to the same kinds of things that you see in the above too. So the severity now, um, it gets figured out. And again, this is not something you have to do. It'll figure it out in the report, whether or not it's mild, moderate, or severe. So it, it, no matter what, it will depend on this um, ratio that they work out between the apneas and the hypopneas. It's called an AHI index, which you'll also see on a report. The amount of respiratory disturbance, um, the AHI is a number that goes towards really towards figuring out what the CPAP setting will be. Um, complications of sleep apnea, you know, so this would be sleep apnea that continues on that is untreated and you will get people who will say, there's no way I'm going to wear a CPAP, forget it. So you got a lot of cardiovascular risk diabetes, stroke, coronary artery disease, stroke, you know, obesity in itself is a problem because you've got fat accumulation in the neck and the tongue and the upper belly, which impacts how, you know, the throat muscles and your throat diameter is already reduced because of the fat deposits and it pushes against the lungs and it, it actually can cause the airway collapse. Hypertension, arrhythmias, metabolic syndrome, poor sleep, depression, because of poor sleep, increased pain, cognitive changes, reduced quality of life, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, work-related disability. You know, there is a certain amount of productivity that's lost every year for people that do not sleep well 
because of sleep apnea. And of course, you're going to get higher healthcare costs because people are going to be sicker. So the treatment really depends on the severity of your sleep apnea. Um, for moderate and severe, the gold standard is what we call positive airway pressure or PAP. It is pressurized air delivered by a machine that pushes the airway open during sleep. The air pressure is at a fixed level. It's a fixed setting on the machine. The challenge, of course, as I alluded to before, is adherence to the positive airway pressure. So things that can kind of interfere with that include the type of machine, the pressure control, is there humidification or is the air dry? How comfortable is it? What's the person's motivation to use it? Do they, are they a side sleeper? Or are they a back sleepers? And they now have, you know, special pillows to help people with the side sleeping. You know, a lot of people don't like the forced air. They don't like the dry air because it dries out the mucous membranes. It causes skin irritation. You know, if you're wearing a mask, it can irritate your skin. Some people feel claustrophobic. Some of the machines are noisy. If people have to get up at night to use the bathroom, it's like, what do I do with my mask? I take my mask off. Some people lay it down and they never put it back on. Sometimes you can keep your mask on, disconnect the tubing and walk into the bathroom. But that can also be fraught with issues for older people. So now, you know, there's a lot more variety in equipment and supplies. And um, you could get smaller units that just sit on your bedside table. They have a mask. They have something called nasal pillows that just go into the nose and, um, and you know, into the nose. And they also have an oral appliance, which is actually um, done by a dentist who specializes in treating um, sleep apnea. There's an auto CPAP, which automatically adjusts the pressure that's coming out according to the changes in breathing that happen with each level of sleep. So each level of sleep, if you're not sleeping as deeply, maybe you need less pressure and the machine's going to automatically adjust for that. There is something called a BiPAP. It's a bi-level positive airway pressure. It helps with breathing. It is described as a type of ventilator, but it's sort of like a step below a ventilator. And it's more for people who have more of the complex or, or the, the complex or mixed sleep apnea. The pressure goes in with inhalation and exhalation. Um, humidification um, is important. It's a good thing to do so people don't dry out. There's also a way to hook up oxygen for people who desat during the night. There's also records in the machine so that people in the lab or the respiratory therapist can monitor how well a person's doing on a CPAP at night and how well they're wearing it. You can look at nightly data that can be accessed via a cell phone to figure out how well people are doing. And, you know, they record compliance so you can figure out whether or not somebody is actually doing what they're saying. Ideally, what they used to say is that if you can get somebody to wear CPAP for a minimum of six hours a night, that that's, that's a good thing. So these are some of the pictures of what they have. Um, you've got a, um, the first picture is more of the nasal. The, the next picture is more of the full fledged mask. Um, the one all the way over on the right that's got the three letters on it, that's the nasal pillows and their picture below that shows you that. Some of the CPAP masks can leak, which is also, so that's a question of fit. And then the American Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine has, that's a, a sample of one of their oral appliances. So when somebody is determined that you do the polysomnography and they are positive, you know, they've got sleep apnea, they go to um, a company that is um, licensed and certified to sell the supplies. So in terms of geriatrics, it would be somebody who is credited by Medicare and there's not that many. You go there or they come to you and they fit you with a mask or fit you with the pillows to make sure things will fit. You have a good seal and things like that. And a lot of times if there's leaking or there's a problem, you can go back to them. The patient can go back to them and fix whatever the problem is. Um, the way things go, sometimes the process of getting the sleep test done to getting a machine and whatever can take time. You know, there's certain, um, charting that you have to do in order to medic have Medicare cover, 
um, what, you know, cover for your patient. And that can take time because there's a lot of back and forth and things like that. During the pandemic, we had a lot of trouble getting um, machines for first time users. We had a lot of trouble getting machines for people who needed new machines because of supply issues. And we had some people who waited 12 months to get a machine. So to help get used to wearing the CPAP, you know, rather than just saying, okay, here's your CPAP, go to bed tonight and put it on. It's scary. And you want to try to set people up as well as you can to be compliant with the CPAP. So I'm not going to go over all the steps, but basically it's, you know, you're, you're going to start with putting the mask in front of your face and you're going to use it for a few minutes and breathing in and out. You do it several times a day till you get comfortable. The next thing is your mask. You put it on during the day. You watch television with it or do whatever. It's not hooked in the machine. You do it until you get comfortable with it. You do it several times a day. And then during the day, you use the mask attached to the machine and you use it for daytime naps. And then you graduate to using the CPAP at night. Um, there's myapnea.org, which is actually a really good website, it gives you a lot of information and some other useful tips and stuff. And I think that it's really good to give people the tips to be able to acclimate to the CPAP. So there's this new treatment called Inspire. And this is for people who really just, they've tried and they just can't adhere to the CPAP. They can't use it. Um, they can't find a mask that fits. If they've got moderate to severe, there is this um, Inspire, which is an upper airway stimulation therapy. So you got to be eligible for it. Um, no significant chronic illnesses, you know, like heart disease, neuromuscular disease, nerve palsy, or upper airway mechanical issues, like really huge tonsils. And you have to have a BMI that's less than 33. Um, and you have to also show that you've had intolerance of CPAP with use less than four hours a night. Um, so the way the Inspire works is um, it is a hypoglossal nerve stimulator. And you can see in the picture, it's a, it kind of looks like a pacemaker. It's a little bit smaller and it's inserted under the skin the way a pacemaker is. So it's outpatient. They make a couple of incisions. There's one under the jaw and one under the right collarbone. They put this device in. It's usually an ENT surgeon that does it. it takes about a month for it to heal and then it gets turned on. And then you have to have a sleep study done afterwards to, to determine the, the, the correct amount of stimulation for that particular patient. The stimulation from the little Inspire goes to the hypoglossal nerve and it does run on batteries. The batteries actually last longer than they do for a pacemaker. They last for about 10 to 11 years. Then there's a little remote control that turns it on and off and can adjust the, the strength of the stimulation. And uh, they say about 70 to 75% of patients who use it will have about a 50% reduction in the apnea with the Inspire. But the, the, the way to qualify it is very, very, very specific. And, you know, they just have to do it on a case by case basis. It's been around for probably, it's been around for probably several years, but it's really only in the last few years that they've really started using it. So the thing I put here about insurance coverage, um, it's it's different. I know I said I was going to talk about kids and stuff like that. Um, so kids do have sleep apnea. And the testing for the sleep apnea for kids and for teens is basically the same with the sleep study. And the machine, the use of a CPAP is the same. They have to get fitted the same way. And there's still the charting that has to be done by the provider in order to have the insurance company, you have to have the correct lingo, for the insurance company to cover the particular machine. And again, um, in geriatrics and in Medicare, there's only a certain number of um, suppliers that are certified. Um, and it's probably true for um, insurance that, you know, kids might have through their parents or whatever, too. But it's it is it has become actually more of an issue for kids in the last several years. So um, that's basically all I have. And thank you guys for listening and and watching the slides. These are my references, by the way, that I have. The, the bulk of what I have, it came from um, 
Johns Hopkins.